APCO educational topic number 54, endometrial hyperplasia and carcinoma. Uterine carcinoma is the most common gynecologic malignancy and approximately 2-3% of women will develop uterine cancer during their lifetime. If the cancer arises from the glands of the endometrium, it is an endometrial carcinoma. If the cancer arises from the mesenchymal uterine components, then it is a sarcoma. 97% of uterine cancers are endometrial cancers and 3% are sarcomas. Fortunately, most patients with endometrial cancer will have early presentation and 90% of women with endometrial cancer will develop symptomatic bleeding or discharge. This can facilitate early diagnosis and most endometrial cancers are diagnosed in stage 1. The 5-year survival for women older than 65 is 81% for white women and 53% for black women. The etiology for this disparity of outcomes is unclear and needs to be further investigated. The objectives of this video are to identify risk factors for endometrial hyperplasia and cancer, to describe the symptoms and physical exam findings with endometrial hyperplasia and cancer, and to outline the causes, diagnosis, and management of postmenopausal bleeding. Endometrial hyperplasia is the most common precursor to endometrial carcinoma. Endometrial hyperplasia is organized into four different World Health Organization classifications. In simple hyperplasia, both the glands and stromal cell elements proliferate excessively. Here are the glands G and the stroma S. Histologically, the glands vary markedly in size from small to cystically enlarged. Complex hyperplasia represents an abnormal proliferation of primarily the glandular elements without proliferation of the stromal elements, thus there will be an increased gland to stromal ratio. The glands appear to be almost back to back. The hyperplasias are then further classified depending on the presence or absence of nuclear atypia. We can thus have simple hyperplasia without atypia and complex hyperplasia without atypia, simple hyperplasia with atypia, and here I am drawing the simple glands again, and complex hyperplasia with atypia. The difference is that atypical cells have disordered maturation with nuclear enlargement, thus have increased nuclear to cytoplasmic ratios, which I am drawing here. Each of these four classifications has a defined risk of progression to cancer. Simple hyperplasia without atypia has a 1% risk. Complex hyperplasia without atypia has a 3% risk. Simple hyperplasia with atypia has an 8% risk. And complex hyperplasia with atypia has a 29% risk of progression to cancer. As a fun aside, notice how easy these numbers can be remembered if you think of multiples of 3. 1, 3, 9, 27. Or you could think of penny, nickel, dime, quarter. It's close enough. Here is a histological slide of simple hyperplasia without atypia, courtesy of Dr. Rich Lieberman. Here is a gland G and stroma S. This next histological slide is complex hyperplasia with atypia. Note the increased gland to stroma ratio and the increased nuclear to cytoplasmic ratio of these cells here. The most significant risk factor for endometrial hyperplasia is exposure to unopposed estrogen, which causes overgrowth of the endometrium. This unopposed estrogen can come from exogenous or endogenous sources. We will now move on to risk factors using our patient, Ms. Edna Metrium. Ms. Edna is getting on in years and older age is our first risk factor. The next risk factor is obesity, for adipose tissue contains aromatase which converts androstenedione to estrone. Now Ms. Edna is receiving pills. If these are high-dose postmenopausal estrogen pills, then this will significantly increase your risk of endometrial hyperplasia and cancer. Remember that estrogen must be given with progesterone for any patient with a uterus. If she has a history of breast cancer and is taking tamoxifen, then this would also be a risk factor. Tamoxifen is a selective estrogen receptor modulator and acts as an estrogen agonist on the endometrium. Poor Ms. Edna also has an ovarian mass, and one specific type of ovarian cancer, the granulosa cell tumor, produces estrogen, thus will be a risk factor. Other risk factors would include characteristics that increase the duration that the endometrium was exposed to estrogen stimulation, so nulliparity, early menarche, and late menopause are all risk factors. Lastly, living in North America or Northern Europe are risk factors as well. Here is a table that summarizes the risk factor and the estimated relative risk of developing endometrial hyperplasia or cancer. Older age, 2 to 3 fold, obesity, 2 to 5 fold, high dose estrogens, 10 to 20 fold, tamoxifen, 3 to 7 fold, infertility and nulliparity, 3 fold, estrogen producing tumor, greater than 5 fold, and residency in North America or Northern Europe, 3 to 18 fold.
Notice that these three risk factors, the high-dose estrogens, tamoxifen, and residency in North America and Europe, have the highest relative risks. Let's move on to symptoms and physical exam findings. We discussed earlier in this video that patients usually present early for the symptoms are often obvious to the patient. I am having abnormal uterine bleeding. Having a high index of suspicion is important, and an endometrial biopsy should be performed on any patient with abnormal uterine bleeding over 35 and a younger woman with additional risk factors that we have previously discussed. Transvaginal ultrasound may be used as an adjunct evaluation for postmenopausal women, for an endometrial stripe of less than 4 millimeters indicates a low probability for endometrial cancer. At this point, let's start thinking about management. To review, we had early presentation with abnormal uterine bleeding. We performed an endometrial biopsy, which demonstrated endometrial hyperplasia. What do we do now? It will depend on what type of hyperplasia she has. For simple and complex hyperplasia without atypia, medical therapy with progesterone is the first-line therapy. The risk of progression of cancer is very low, and the progesterone therapy will decrease the glandular proliferation. The most common progesterone therapy is oral medroxyprogesterone acetate. When atypia is present, there is more concern for progression of endometrial cancer. Of note, simple hyperplasia with atypia is a relatively rare finding, and we will focus on complex hyperplasia with atypia. Definitive therapy with hysterectomy is recommended once childbearing is complete for women with complex atypical hyperplasia. For women who desire future fertility, long-term, high-dose progesterone therapy may be attempted to avoid hysterectomy. However, this does require frequent endometrial sampling to ensure that disease progression has not occurred. As we have discussed, the etiology for most endometrial cancers is secondary to excess estrogen exposure. Endometrial cancers that are estrogen-dependent are classified as type 1. 90% of endometrial cancers are type 1. The more aggressive variety of endometrial cancer, type 2, accounts for 10% of cases. There is no clear epidemiological profile for type 2 cancers. Type 2 cancers tend to have aggressive high-grade nuclei or clear cell histology. Let's discuss postmenopausal bleeding for a moment. This is bleeding that occurs after 12 months of amenorrhea. The risk of endometrial cancer is 10 to 15% for these patients, so endometrial sampling must occur. Other causes include endometrial atrophy, which accounts for 60 to 80% of postmenopausal bleeding. Hormone therapy, 15 to 25 percent. Endometrial polyps, 2 to 12 percent. And endometrial hyperplasia, 5 to 10 percent. Therefore, when a patient presents with postmenopausal bleeding, the evaluation should include an endometrial biopsy, careful physical and pelvic examination, pelvic ultrasound, and don't forget to screen for cervical cancer with a pap smear. This concludes the APCO educational video on endometrial hyperplasia and cancer. We have reviewed risk factors, symptoms, physical exam findings, and management for women with endometrial hyperplasia, cancer, and postmenopausal bleeding.